Good morning, everybody. ERS is more prevalent in the country than HIV. ERS is more prevalent in the church than HIV. ERS is much more prevalent here and in Hermanus than just about anything else. ERS is Eleanor Rigby syndrome. It's lonely people. Lonely people. We've been looking at, at DNA for the church, real church DNA. What, what are those fundamental issues that we find in Scripture that need to be part of every single church? This morning we're looking at fellowship because you see God's solution for ERS is what we call fellowship. God's solution. God's solution for loneliness is fellowship. We've celebrated being a family. We come together as a church. We talk us about ourselves as being a body. This is the family of God. And the tragedy is that there are people suffering with ERS sitting next to you. And one of the most heartbreaking positions to find oneself in is when you're suffering with ERS in a marriage. And some are suffering here. If fellowship is God's solution for ERS, there are many who don't experience God's Provision, God's solution. Can we take the monitors off, Debs? It can't be, you say to yourself. She's smiling sitting here next to me. He's got a wife. They've got kids. How can they be lonely? It's easy to wear a face that you keep in a jar by the door. It's easy to leave home, put on the right face, and to come and stand in front of everybody else ache inside because that ERS is eating you up. Last week we started looking at the essential DNA. What are the fundamental issues that there are in each church? What do we find in scripture? We looked at, at Acts chapter 2 after Pentecost, after Peter's Pentecost speech and, and in essence the birth of the, of the church as we know it today found in Acts chapter 2. Because DNA is, is what makes us essentially human. And church DNA is what makes the gathering of people that we call the church different from the gathering of people that is a bridge club or a golf club or the rotary or any other gathering of people. So we've got to say, what is the DNA that we find in the church? What is that essential thing? As much as DNA makes us as humans different from animals and different from plants, what's the DNA in the church that makes the church gathering different from other gatherings? The first bit of DNA that we looked at last week was, was hearing God speak. The church is made up of people who hear God speak and have accepted his word and responded to it. Those who accepted his word, we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, those who accepted his, his word, his message, were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They accepted the word of God and responded. It's the first fundamental of being part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Accepting his word when the Holy Spirit moves and responding. Second part of the DNA that we looked at last week was that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. They, they took these things and they were important, fundamental to being a gathering that we call the church. 
You see, they devoted themselves. They made an effort to grow. This wasn't just something of saying, well, we've been blessed by God now in a special way. Let's just wait for him to continue. They chose to do something in order to grow their spiritual life as well. They made an effort to grow in their understanding of Jesus and and who Jesus had done. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, but then they devoted themselves also to this thing we call fellowship, koinonia. You've heard the word before. To socialize together. They took sacrificial steps to nurture themselves and to nurture one another in this thing we call fellowship. And it didn't just happen. And if we're going to be a church reflecting biblical DNA, being the biblical blueprint, we have to nurture, choose to nurture our spiritual lives. It's a choice we make, folks. It's a choice we make. That being devoted to, they committed themselves to the fellowship. Being born again and having the Holy Spirit bring us into a relationship with God is wonderful. But he he then brings us into a family as well. Story that is told of a a mom putting to sleep her her little five-year-old. As she kisses him goodnight and about to walk out the door and switches off the light, he says, Mom, please won't you come and, and stay with me till I fall asleep? And she says, but why? He says, I, I'm afraid of the dark. And Mom says, but you don't have to be afraid. Jesus is with you. And the little boy said, yes, but sometimes I need people with skin on. <laughs> and sometimes it's good to know that we have fellowship with God. Sometimes we need people with skin on. And that's the fellowship that they're talking about here. And it would be wrong to think that they simply placed themselves under good teaching. And as long as they had good teaching, in certain circles that becomes the be-all and end-all. If we can just have good teaching, so I can stay at home and watch TV because I've got the best in the world, the good teaching. So that's my church. Sorry, my friend, it's not. Church is where we have the fundamentals of teaching and fellowship. And next week I'm going to talk about communal devotion. (coughs) Communal devotion. Fellowship is the the one thing that they were all committed to. And it's elaborated more in in this uh, book of Acts than, than any of the others. We read in chapter 2 and verse 44 to 46, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They, they shared everything. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. And now you're becoming scared. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They continued to meet together. That is the same word that is used in verse verse 42, that they devoted themselves. It's the same word. They were devoted to meeting together. Devotedly, determinedly doing it every day, selling their possessions. But it doesn't have to be that we follow everything that they did. We need to say, what's the blueprint? What is the DNA that we need to extract out of this and say, this is what is what we need to be as a church? Because we need to follow the blueprint. In verse 46, we read that every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, large gathering in the temple courts because they couldn't fit everybody into, into a house. And they broke bread in their homes. Breaking bread may have referred to what we've just done here. It may just have been they had a meal together. That's a phrase that we use as well. They broke bread in their homes and in the temple courts. And they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Those two environments, the large group, the smaller group environment, are are, are just fundamental to to church life. It literally, it it comes out in in one sentence um, in the original which means every day they were continuing devotedly and unitedly in the temple, breaking bread in their homes and eating together with glad and sincere hearts. 
And as much as they made an effort to, to nurture their lives by the apostles' teaching, which would have happened in the temple, they also devoted themselves to meeting together in homes. And don't be fooled into thinking that just this just happened. They had to make an effort. They devoted themselves to it. And it's worth getting to know people, become friends, and the symptoms of ERS start to go away. But notice that firstly, they socialized together. They met together in the temple courts and broke bread in their homes with glad and sincere hearts. They were glad together. That word glad, that the translators have struggled with that word and with, uh, uh, with glad and sincere hearts. They've, they've struggled with that translation. Glad, the word there is, they were exultantly joyful when they got together. They were rejoicing. They were celebrating. We, we've got a word that, is, that has started off as a noun and it's become a verb in, in a lot of modern environments. And that word is partying. Usually when I hear the word partying, I think, okay, we know where that's going to end up. Right? But this is sort of what they were doing here. They were getting together and they were exuberantly joyful to be together. It was part of fellowship. It's part of the blueprint of us as a church. Socializing together, enjoying one another's company with glad and sincere hearts. That word actually means that with, with huge generosity, which is seen in the way they, they behaved towards one another because we read that they also cared for one another. They cared for one another. They gave to anyone as he had need. In Luke chapter 4, Luke continues to explain this a little bit more. Uh, that's why I say this, this issue of fellowship is something that is, that is taken out, and, and, and it's quite extensive in the book of Acts. That all the believers, Luke, uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, we read that all the believers were one in heart and mind. There was a, a, a joyous oneness amongst them. And no one claimed that any of his positions was his own, but they shared everything they had. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it, it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Don't be hung up on the fact that they sold everything they had. That was one of the ways that they chose to express the essential DNA that God had planted in their hearts as a community. But notice this, what is that that they did? They cared for one another enough to make sure that there was no need amongst them. They did whatever was necessary in order to care for one another. And that's at the heart of it. They enjoyed being together. They celebrated when they were together and they cared for one another. That's what fellowship is all about. They made an effort to do this. But how do we do that? How do we do that? Because, folks, let's be honest, there are differences amongst us here. I mean, I have my opinion and you're all wrong. <laughs> there are differences. We have cultural differences amongst us. We have age differences amongst us. But we need to make an effort to get past those differences if we're going to be a church demonstrating the DNA that Scripture gives to us. And it starts off with needing to acknowledge that fellowship is important. But how do we do this? Well, by talking with one another, interacting with one another. Um, ask others about how, how did their journey with the Lord start? How did your spiritual journey start? <clears throat> so how can I... Interact with someone that I don't know. Well, ask them questions, simple questions. Like, so, you know, what's your name? Where do you come from? Uh, how long have you been in Amarnas? All of those are usual sort of small talk type questions around here, right? But it's a start. That's where you start going. That's where you start from. And then you can start asking questions like, I'm struggling to pray. What do you find helpful? Or how do you share the gospel with your adult children? Or how 
do you understand why it's necessary for Jesus to die, to be a sacrifice? And then to listen to what the other person's saying. Oh, there are a myriad of questions we could ask one another. But be willing to ask questions with the intention of listening to hear what the other person actually has to share with us. The one thing to do is to shun preaching. Shun preaching. Or a preaching tone. Or telling others what this is right because someone said it on TV. But sharing, saying, you know, this is what I found helpful. And then learning to listen. To hear what the other pe person's saying. Not dominating the conversation. And you know, it doesn't have to happen in a church building or in a home. It could happen as you're going for a, a walk on the cliff path. It could happen when you're sitting down for coffee somewhere at a coffee shop. It could happen when you're on a drive to Stanford. It could even happen after a church service when you have coffee in the hall which means that you don't just make a dash for the gate. <clears throat> because that's the element of fellowship that one wants to nurture in a church. Fellowship is where barriers are broken between people. Barriers between people are broken. Oh, goodness, where have I lost it? Barriers between people are broken down. Some years back, if I'm right, probably about 25 years ago, I forget the exact time. Desmond Tutu gave South Africans, as we broke into our new democracy, he gave us a, a picture that many of us latched onto. A picture of the Rainbow Nation. Do you remember that? Of course you know the phrase. 25 years later, as people have worked, politicians have worked supposedly on building our rainbow nation, we have a rainbow. That, that's the sort of rainbow we have. Can you see that rainbow? It, it's got all the right colors. I, I, asked, I preached the sermon right away at 8.30, so um, some of you may have heard it before, but do you, do you remember at school, do you remember Vibgyor? Do you? Sorry? Oh, oh, you go the other way. Oh, okay. Ah, someone did it the other way. But Wilma's always done things the other way, so that's okay. Vibgyor. <laughs> that's the way I did it anyway. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. Because those are the colors of the rainbow. And you've got them all there. And you know what? Politicians have been working on building this supposed rainbow nation. But you know, that's what happens when you have man-made rainbows. The colors are clearly demarcated and there's no mixing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. When God makes a rainbow, that's what happens. Yesterday, Val and I were going off to Paul and on the way we, we, we saw this magnificent rainbow. It was the best that we had ever seen um, in all our 103 years of life. And it was really magnificent. I don't know if any of you saw it. Right across Hermanus here. But even in that magnificent rainbow, do you know what happened? The colors were all fuzzy and smudgy. The one blended into the other and overlapped, and you couldn't see the lines between the two. When men, mankind, people, try to create a rainbow nation, you end up with the demarcation between the colors. The National Party could have had a rainbow nation here in South Africa. As long as you had the demarcation between the colors. Our present leaders have done no better. But when God makes a rainbow in the church, it gets fuzzy and smudgy. And it, it doesn't demarcate so clearly, but it looks beautiful. It looks beautiful. At the AGM, we made a decision towards to working towards becoming a more multi-generational church. And you know, we, we let you folk know about that some two months or more beforehand, and there was the document that came out, the yellow paper, do you remember all that? Um, and people spoke about it, and, and numbers of people, uh, there, were, there, were, there, there was one person who said to me, why do we want younger people here? We've got nothing in common with younger people. 
um, now, now, there was only one person, but there were others who didn't say it quite as clearly. But they, and, and maybe you're sitting here feeling that. I, I, I don't know. But you know what? That, that's the man-made rainbow. When God makes a rainbow, it gets, it gets fuzzy and smudgy. And, and, and there are old and young, and there are different ideas that permeate. And, and, and you find that there are cultural differences, and there are educational differences, and there are social standing differences, and it all becomes a little bit smudgy. That's a Jacksonianism, by the way. But it's genuine church fellowship that can bring about this kind of change. And the DNA in our church remains the same as it was for them on that day of after that day of Pentecost. They were grounded in what Jesus said. And when we find people who are different, do you know what is our common bond that can make us all fuzzy? Our common bond is this. I don't necessarily just mean the table, but what this represents. That it's Jesus, having died for us, who makes us one. He has broken down the dividing wall of partition. Do you know, when you read about the dividing wall of partition, do you know the dividing wall of partition he's talking about? between peoples, because both Jew approaches God through Jesus, Gentile approaches God through Jesus, we both approach God through Jesus. That's what makes us family. That's what makes us a rainbow nation. That's what makes us a rainbow church. And in the early church, there must have been times when they didn't feel like it, but they made the effort. There must have been disagreements on all sorts of issues. I'm sure there were. There was one, the first big disagreement that the church had was because of racial conflict. <coughs> racial conflict in the church. The, 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 the Greek widows were complaining that they weren't getting this, the same amount of help as the Jewish widows were getting. It was because of racial. They said it's because you guys are benefiting them more than us. And so they appointed deacons, by the way, and they sorted the problem out. But it was racial conflict that caused that, that first appointment of deacons. And they continued determinedly. And so the writer to the Hebrews says to us, let's not let give up meeting together. But let's encourage one another. Some are choosing to do this. Some are choosing to give up, saying it's not necessary. I don't know how many times I've heard, uh, all I need is just, I, I watch TV. I can see Hillsong. I can get the best teaching. I can sing along with them. <laughs> but we need one another. We need people with skin on. And so often our, our fellowship has been like billiard ball fellowship. I know I've said this before, but these are billiard balls. You know, you know billiard balls. You know what they do? They connect and they part. They connect and they part. They connect and they part. Fellowship is like balls of plasticine. And when they come together, the one takes the shape of the other. And sometimes there's a bit of yellow that, that sticks to the blue. And it, this has got cold and hard, so it doesn't work. But when it's warm, it does it. Maybe there's a lesson in that too. When you're cold and hard, it doesn't work. <laughs> Fellowship is like balls of plasticine. It comes together, taking one shape from another, leaving a little bit of the yellow and the blue and a bit of the blue and the yellow. And that's what God has given to us as the antidote to ERAs. And the underlying principle of fellowship is given by the Apostle Paul when he wrote to the Philippians. And he said this, let's do nothing out of selfish ambition vain conceit. But here's the rub. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. That is at the heart of fellowship. In the evenings, we're watching this series on AD, Kingdom and Empire. It's the first book of Acts. Some of the persecution, the, the 
obvious thing that comes out of that series is the persecution that the people suffered. And there's a phrase that, that is spoken by the actor who is playing uh, Peter. And, and he says at one point, he says, the one besides you stand, the one beside you stands because you're there to hold him up. And we become a strong church when we enjoy the kind of fellowship where we're next to one another, holding one another up as God wants us to. It's sad that there are so many people suffering from ERS in Amanus. It's sadder still that there are so many suffering from ERS in United Church in Amanus. But we can change that. In fact, God calls us to change that. Calls us to a kind of fellowship that is marked by, by love and forgiveness when people hurt us and, and, and caring for one another and wanting to enjoy one another. This is what God wants for you. This is what God wants for us. But we're going to have to take steps to do that. And you're going to have to, I mean, you singular are going to have to take it. If you're saying, I'm lonely, I'm one of those people who's really struggling to connect. Do you know what? You have to take the steps. Because you look so happy and contented on the outside. I don't know that you're lonely. When we do and we become like plasticine, we start to become the church that God wants us to be. We grow in genuine fellowship with one another. I want to ask you to pray on your own, for yourself. Pray that you will have the courage to take the step that is necessary to deal with the loneliness inside of yourself. To reach out to somebody else. And if you're saying, that doesn't apply to me, then will you pray that God will show you how you can reach out to someone who does have the symptoms Take a moment to do that, please. Lord, we want to be the people, we want to be the church that you want us to be. Please work in us in such a way that when other people, that when other people look on, those who are on the outside also suffering from loneliness, that they will want to become part of us, knowing that they will be accepted warmly and loved here amongst us. Lord, I want to pray for anyone, for those who are here, who know what it is to suffer with loneliness. And I pray, Lord, that we would be, we would more and more become the people who reach out to one another in love.